Good evening, everyone. Welcome to, again, this week to the Bahamas Natural Resources Foundation Emerging Leaders Development Program. Let's do a quick check-in to see how everyone is doing. Let's start with you, Ethan. How are you today? I'm doing well, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing well, doing very, doing well. Ethan, uh, now to go to O'Neill. How about yourself? Um, I'm good. I had a really productive day regarding the video. Yes, I saw that. Yes, stars are being born, right, Kaylin? How are you, sir? All, all is well. I see you're, you're, you're following in Mario's footsteps. Mario's going to seem, he's going to compete with, with Nahasha pretty soon, <laughs> doing his broadcasting. Jabez, how are you, sir? How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. Just had a kind of tiresome day, but they're still tracking on, so. That's a, right. that's a good thing. How about how about you, uh, Trey? How about you, how are you doing? Pretty good, hot but good, like I always say. Okay, and and Miss Darville, Felicity, how are you? I am wonderfully blessed and excited for today's session. Excellent. I thought I saw I thought I saw a um, Ferrara before. I guess I did not. So, and then we have our directors. Uh, Mario and, of course, the, the fearless Andrea, how are you? Y'all doing well? Oh, Andrea, it's like she's frozen. Is she frozen? Oh, no, she's not. I'm not frozen. I'm just keeping still. <laughs> <laughs> but no, everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> Very productive. So. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm going to uh, introduce Joe McPhee in a moment. So be as we do this, we're going to first um, let me activate the Facebook Live. And then we will start the process, which will be in a couple seconds. Good evening, Facebook audience. I want to welcome you once again. My, I am Aj Cunningham, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Bahamas Natural Resources Foundation. Welcome to this week's broadcast of our Emerging Leaders Development Program. For those who might be visiting for the very first time, we have a 12-week program that we designed for our young future leaders in the Bahamas part of our, our, our strong belief in the foundation of investing in people. And so we decided at the leadership team that we have such wonderful dynamic speakers that's really empowering and, and, and touching base with our emerging leaders that it make good sense to really to share this with the general public throughout our Bahama land. So in that regard, this week, we have another dynamic and wonderful speaker that's, go, that's joining us. And that is Mr. Joel McPhee. Now, Joel is a risk executive with Bank of America. And in that role, he's head of business controls for the global capital banking, excuse me, global, global capital planning and global, global real estate and strategic initiative divisions of Bank of America Corporation. He and his team serves as the central point of management and coordination for a number of critical activities and deliverables. Now, prior to joining, uh, taking his current role, Joel led the quality and assurance and risk team for global capital planning, which supported bank efforts to meet its obligation for the with CCAR, which is the Comprehensive Capital Analysis and Review, as well as the GRRP, which stands for the Global Resolution and Recovery Requirements. Prior to being with Bank of America, Joel was a senior executive at Wells Fargo. Now, during his time there, he successfully led what is heralded as one of the most successful transformation initiatives in the bank's history. Through this initiative, he managed a cross-enterprise team, which reduced Wells Fargo's $3 billion CapEx, which is short for capital expenditure, and revenue project portfolio by approximately 40%. Joel has multiple tasks. He's also an attorney and a published author. 
in his debut book title, Mastering Strategic Risk, of, <coughs> excuse me, Mastering Strategic Risk, a Framework for Leading the tr and Transforming Organizations, which was published in 2014. He provides, he provides a new governance model detailing how to effectively lead organizations through challenging times. He also co-authored an artic article that's titled, Why Government Regulators Need Corporate Boot Camps. And he, this was published in the Washington Post. Joel serves as a lecturer in Virginia Tech University Pamplin Business College for its Leadership Academy, and also serves as a member of the university's Business Leadership Center's Advisory Board. Well, I and nevertheless, also Joel is a Bahamian. Joel, which island are you are you from? Which island? Uh, yeah, I was gonna go into that. I am from Nassau. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. grew up. I grew. I grew up between Nassau and Freeport, spending the first few years in Nassau and then moving to Freeport, and then as a teenager migrating to the U.S. Well, welcome, Joel, and the floor is now yours. Good evening, everyone. I'm excited to be here and spend time with you. And and just I, you know, Naj, you mentioned uh, Aj, you mentioned the. Uh, the different islands that people are from. I'm curious to see where some of you all are from. Andre, is that Andre? Where are you from? Andrea, Andrea Moultrie. That's Andrea, I'm sorry. Hi, um, I grew up in Nassau, but my family okay. is, um, one side is Cat Island and the other side is okay. and Long Island. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Trey? I see you there. Uh, as I am 100% Nassauvian, my mother, my father, but he yeah. is from Nassau, so yeah. Okay. From the capital. Okay. Okay. Ethan? Yes, sir. Uh, I am from New Providence. I was born here, but my okay. parents are expatriate teachers. My father is Guyanese and my mother is Jamaican. Are you from the east or the west and the, uh, the south and, and Nassau? Where, where are you from? I'm from the east. Okay, okay. Is Kaylin, or is that, did I pronounce that right? McCartney? Yes, sir. Okay. And where are you from? Um, I'm from Nassau, but I have family okay, in okay. Long Island. Okay, okay. O'Neill, Mario, and Jabez. What about you all? I'm from Nassau. Okay. Uh, I'm from Nassau, and my grandparents are from Cat Island. Uh, Luther. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, the same family background from Luther, okay. but mostly in Nassau. Okay. Okay. And Jabez. Oh yeah, I said that my um, I'm from Nassau, but my grandparents. Okay, uh, okay. From, okay. Yeah, from okay. Cat Island and from Eleuther. Yes, uh, did I miss anybody? Jared. Okay, Jared. Okay. Good day. I am from uh, Hey Jared, Long Island, and Port of Prince. Okay. 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 Yeah. So so although I'm a Nassauvian. I have Cat Island, Exuma, the Rock, Meguana, and Ackland. So, so you know, a hodgepodge of, of islands. So I, I'm glad to be here and excited uh, to present this, this, this session on executive presence. And I wanted to ask the question, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this a very interactive dialogue. So I'm not gonna speak to you, I'm gonna speak with you. We're gonna be talking. So at times I may call on you, but I wanna make this very interactive. When you think about executive presence, what comes to your mind? What is executive presence to you? And don't be shy at all. There's no right or wrong answers. Uh, how do you appear in a professional um, regard? How you appear and how- Appearance? Uh, interpret you, yeah. Okay, and so what, what is that, what, when you say appearance, what does that, what does that mean to you? 
Uh, that kind of means, mm, I guess the uh, not the R that you give off, but if you give off kind of um, a warm and inviting or a kind of managing and directing from a distance, like what your energy is, I'd say. Okay, okay. Anybody else? Thank you, Jay Beth. Um, I'll also go into how you speak as well, how you present your okay. words or how you speak to others. Okay. Yes, the language you use. Okay. Yeah, and, so uh, and, and, and I'll and take one more. One. What's that? Verbal and nonverbal, uh, the way how you carry yourself. Yes, yes, that's very important. And, and I, I have another question. What's the connection? I, I listened to your previous session. What's the connection between brand and executive presence? And we're going to go into this a little later. What, what's the connection? Reputation. Reputation? What else about brand? Uh, I would what say... Is, what, what, I would uh, say... I, I would say that your executive presence is a part of your brand. When they, uh -huh. when they look at you, they can kind of judge or listen to you, however, whatever situation it is, they can kind of tell what your brand or what you're giving off. So, th so there's a connection between brand and executive presence, and we're gonna go into and so some of those connections a little later. The first question I, I, I'm gonna ask, and, and Oz, before I go to the first slide, I wanna ask them a question. When you meet someone, what do you immediately notice about them? You, you said some of the things here. The way they talk? Yes. Um, I, the first thing I look at is as their facial expressions and how they, how they dress, how they present themselves. Okay. Someone mentioned communication, right? How they, how they talk, right? how they present themselves verbally. And how quickly do you think we make judgments about people? When Probably you meet someone, mean. how quickly do you assess them? Go ahead. In like the so first five seconds. What's that? In, in the, in the first five seconds. As soon as them. As soon as you see them. Yep, and I let my prejudice okay. determine how I could treat them. <laughs> but you know what? You're it's right. A, it's, a, it's a shortcut. It's a shortcut strategy that I learned in life. I mean, if it walk like a duck and it quack like a duck, I'm not going to take two weeks to try to figure if you are a duck. Yes. And um, uh, can you go to the first slide, please? Sure. Is this the first one? Oh, sorry, hold on. Here we go. Yeah. This the second slide, yeah. No. Yes. The, yes. Thank you. So we make judgments about someone's likability, their confidence, and trustworthiness in one tenth of a second. And and as I think as Mr. Darville mentioned, right? Jared Darville mentioned. Was that you, Jared? Yes, yes, that's me. That, yeah, within 30 seconds, you, are, you have formed your impressions of an individual. And once you have formed that impression, you know, that, that is it's a challenge to overturn that impression you have of that individual. So we make judgments of individuals so almost immediately. Therefore, when we interact with people, it's very important to make a very impactful first impression. Now, what in your mind is executive presence? We, I know we talked about what exactly is executive presence. I'm going to go, you could go to the next slide. Uh, Did it change? You got it? We talked about, a, yes, uh-huh. We talk about appearance. We talk about communication. We talk about gravitas. Right, gravitas, communication, and, and appearance. When you think about these three components, I think as Bahamians, we are na we naturally 
uh, have executive presence as a part of who we are. And, and why would you say that when you think about how you were, you were reared? You know, for example, I had a grandmother who was, from, who was from Devil's Point, Cat Island. She didn't have more than an eighth grade education. But my grandmother taught me a certain things about executive presence. What are some of the things that we are taught in our Bahamian culture that lends itself to executive presence? To be morally and uh, respectable. And that kind of shows you as being someone who's trustworthy if you have more manners and approachableness, I guess. Hey, you have to have manners, right? That's, that's a bedrock principle in Bahamian culture. What else? You have to look put together. So for an example, I know one of the things they always say is even if you're going to the shop, I your clothes because you never know who you're going to meet. Exactly. Appearance, right? You taught earlier about appearance. What are some other things you were taught? Your Grammy taught you, your grandfather taught you, your parents taught you, uncles, aunts, what else? Come on. What about how you how you communicate? Right? Speak up. Right? We're taught to speak that? up and to speak. What's that? Uh, to wear a smile, put on a smile, put on a happy face. Put on a happy face. Speak up. Put on a happy face. But speak and and and, and don't speak too timidly. Right? You, we're taught to speak forcefully. What about, what about this one? You know, I remember my grandmother when I was about eight years old, my grandmother told me, she says, they call me Joey. She says, look, Joey, if an adult step on your foot, you look them in the eye and you tell them, look, sir, ma'am, with all due respect, but you, you, you might, you're stepping on my foot and my foot's hurting. So we were taught, right, to, to look people in the eye and to speak directly to them. These, all of these characters, and, and also posture, right? Aren't we taught to, to keep our chin up and to, to, to walk erect, don't slouch? These are things that we were taught and that are, are embedded in our culture that are, a, uh, that are very much a part of our culture. Would you agree? Yes. Very much, very much so. Anything else anybody ha has to add to, to what, we, what you were taught as, 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 as in our culture around, around executive presence? If you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, I want to go to, and, and thank you for, for uh, participating and, and, and answering those questions. I want to go to the next slide and I want to talk about um, gravitas. And gravitas is how you act, right? So, according to, to, to top leaders, senior leaders, depending on if you're a man or a woman, decisiveness or showing teeth is the most important part of executive press, of gravitas. Confidence and grace under fire, right? So think about this. So things go wrong, right? And you're under pressure. Do you want to be a leader or someone who is, is, is managing people who melts or has, has difficulty staying and being in charge and showing your cool through that difficult time? Another thing is integrity and authenticity. Do you speak truth? Are you someone who could be depended upon to be authentic and to be real? Emotional intelligence, what, what, what do we think about emotional intelligence? What is emotional intelligence to you? What does it mean? Being able to fully, I guess, not just understand someone's emotions, but read their emotions without them having to verbally say and then respond in a healthy and conclusive manner. Okay, that's a, that's a part of it. What else? What are some other aspects of emotional intelligence? Um, I would also say another part is how you communicate 
um, your feelings in a respectful manner because we all we all know that it's one of the biggest issues we have is being able to communicate our, our emotion, our emotional state in a effective manner. So, so, and also being, being to empathize with people, right? Empathy, having empathy towards people, understanding, trying to put yourself in their shoes. What are some other aspects of empathy when it comes to um, emo um, emotional intelligence, of intelligence? What are some other aspects of emotional intelligence? I'll give you one. What about this? Suppose you, you come into a situation, right? You're at home, you have things are terrible at home. You're a leader, right? You have your own business. You may be in management of the company and you have problems at home. If you come into the workplace and you come and you are leading people, how does it look if you're bringing that, that mood, those attitudes into the workplace, into your professional environment? You're not exhibiting emotional intelligence. What are, what are some other aspects of emotional intelligence? I guess being able to be bigger than your feelings. So kind of compartmentalize yes. the feelings. Yes, yes. All of these things that we're talking about exemplify gravitas and are a critical part and component of executive presence. And we can't forget, you see 50% here is vision and charisma. We can't talk enough about charisma and how charisma is such a, an important part of Gravita, um, and most um, executive presence. So when you think about, I showed, I showed you three on the on the front slide. You, there were three individuals. Um, we had Ken Chenault, who's the CEO or the former CEO of uh, American Express, Michelle Obama, and Miles Monroe. And if you think about, especially the the, the more the more popular individuals such as Miles Monroe, who we would know. And of course, Michelle Obama, when you think about charisma and you think about how they carry themselves, they were very charismatic. They were very endearing to people. So gravitas has, is comprised of these six or so, so components and, can, and there are probably many more that we can talk about. Any question about gravitas? And, and I have a question for women, for the women. What's more important, or even the men, what's more important for women as far as gravitas? Is there anything here that's very important? Especially in a patriarchal society that we have at, back home? I think confidence, but at the same time, I think they get labeled for being overly aggressive so i mean it's kind of i don't know it's kind of different for them i don't know any it's, hello any women on the go ahead uh-huh for me it's probably their it's probably two things either their uh, on that um integrity authenticity and speaking power which is i think we appreciate uh -huh. the most or probably their emotional intelligence because what I, what, what I have found is working with people, I think that's one of the most biggest complaints that we have is, again, the, the belief in emotional um, intelligence. Okay. And what do you think about decisiveness is showing teeth, grace under fire, and confidence and grace under fire? You know, you know, oftentimes, you know, unfortunately, this is a very important thing for women because we, you know, we categorize, unfortunately, and incorrectly, women sometimes as not having grace under fire because we label them as being emotional. But it's very important for women to show that grace under fire and that confidence, as someone said. And also decisiveness, you know, being very um, decisive and sure uh, and self-assured of, of the direction and your decisions and, and what you want to do. Any other any other points before we move on? Uh, yeah, just to say that um, sometimes for uh, at least what women in business uh, speak about in terms of the way they're viewed in terms of their gravitas is that, as Jabez said, it's a 
it's a tight rope to walk because certain traits that are considered traits for executives. Um, yes, yes, yes. When they're displayed um, in a masculine sense, it's viewed as a positive. In a feminine sense, it's viewed as a negative. Um, so sometimes what's seen as being confident in a man would be seen as being bossy or arrogant. Mm, aggressive, no aggressive. Yeah, aggressive, yes, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, yes. so uh -huh. sometimes when a man can be emotional, a woman will be seen as being hysterical, you know? So it's a, it's a tight rope sometimes. You know, to your point, um, that's Andrea. Was that you speaking, Andrea? It's sometimes, you know, I, li I, I live, I, I, I work in a very white world. In corporate America, I, I work in, you know, it's been my, throughout my career, it's been a white world. And one thing we're, you know, as a, as a confident, confident black man or black women, we are often labeled as the angry black man or black, black woman. Because, you know, someone of another color can say and, and act a certain way and be, you know, and show that confidence and that assertiveness. But for us, to your point, you know, we are labeled as having a chip on our shoulder sometimes. So that's a, that's a tight, walk, uh, tight rope that we walk. Oz, we could go, we could go to the next slide. So here are some gravitas blunders, unethical behavior, vacillates too much, inflated opinion of oneself. How, how could the an inflated opinion of oneself hurt your gravitas? Uh, well, people, okay, so it can hurt your way in, in that you cannot take constructive criticism. So if you think very highly of yourself, there's no room for improvement. And I always believe that there's always room for improvement. And people tend to don't like that because if if you say, listen, man, Mr. McPhee, you know, your, your balance sheet's off, a supplement's off, and then you take that as an offense, then I'm just saying what the truth is so how we can prove. If you can't improve, then you are you're a terrible lad, you're however it's pronounced. Good point, good point there. Can someone who, who has an inflated, you know, who's kind of cocky or has an inflated sense of opinion of themselves, do they seem like people that have their feet on the ground, really? Do they seem grounded? What do you think? Anybody? Uh, I'd say it depends on the, the recipient of the person. Because take Donald Trump. Um, half the world sees okay. him as a megalomaniac, and the other half sees him That's as That's a great a, example. <laughs> yeah, a great businessman, you know, the most ethical, most religious Christian person on the face of the planet. So, and you could, I think we all could agree he has an inflated opinion of himself. So I think it depends. Right, right. Right. But to your point, I think I think a lot of people, some of the people who like him, like him for a lot of other things too, right? Uh, because of, of their political position or their the way they view the world. But that's a great example. What about lack deep expertise? And and you know when I was growing up in Nassau, right? We I don't know if it's still the same, right? You ha we you run across people, right, who talk a lot about everything but know very little about the subjects they talk we, we used to call them flammers i don't know if y'all still use that term flammers but um what, what 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 are your thoughts about people who lack deep expertise how do they come across to you um so and i, I think like i think so I like ahead. politicians yeah Politicians? Okay. Uh, uh, we, I mean, we see it all the time. Uh, uh, somebody, for my example, my field of studies is agriculture. And I'd sit back and listen to some of these people who call themselves 
quote unquote explicit agriculture, talking about throwing coconut in the ground, letting the things grow. I roll my eyes, I raise my eyebrows, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and they've been doing this longer than me, and I'm just starting, and I know more. And I'm, I ask myself, how is this even possible? Okay. So I, it, I it, comes off, it comes off as, you don't know what you're talking about. Exactly, exactly. And we run into those people all the time. And so it takes away from their gravitas, right? It, it takes away from it. What, um, Oz, we could go to the next slide, please. So uh, again, looking at the survey of top, uh, top senior leaders, these are the aspects of communication that they found that were, were most important. Forcefulness and assertiveness, superior speaking skills, ability to command the room. Have you been, have you ever been in a room with someone who commands, who commands the room? Can you, could you provide an example? Jobs. So let me give you an example. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, probably Steve Jobs. He's pretty good at that. He was. He was good at that. Uh, another person I've never was in the room with him, but a person they said commanded the room was Bill Clinton. When he walked into the room, he just had an aura about him. He just had a way in which he greeted people. And you and I know you know many examples of people. As soon as they walk in the room, they just command the attention of everyone because of the way they carry, the way they Trump. interact. Donald Trump, that's a good example of someone who has the ability to command the room. What are some other examples? Uh, so Lyndon Pinland. Ah, great example, great example. You see that with most, you see that with most, like with most good leaders, like even Vladimir Putin, all of these type leader type persons, even Ash, Ash Cunningham. I don't know if you know uh -huh, him. Uh -huh. Right? <laughs> yes, but I know Ash. He's from the Bahamas. Uh -huh. Yeah, he commands uh -huh. the room as well. What about body language and posture and ability to, to read? Client, a uh, uh, boss, client, a room. I mean, and and sense of humor and ability to banter. See, uh, one thing about communication that's important, and, and when we talk about executive presence and like, is about likability. So your ability. Have you been around people and and you you're you're meeting them for the first time and they're bantering and they're joking and they're teasing with you. They're teasing with you. That's a way in which they're endearing you to themselves. That's a way they. That, that, that is something that really enhances their likability. Anything, anything else about body language and posture? What if you come into the room and you slouch stuff, you know, or you walk in and you have your head up and your, your head up, your chin up and you're walking confidently. Those are aspects of communication that are very important. They're subtle. Making eye contact, you know, it's there. There's again with, with Bill Clinton. What I was told is when you when Bill Clinton is meeting you and talking to you, it's as if there's no one else in the room. He can be in the room of hundreds of people, but his his focus is is precisely on you. So all of these 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 aspects of communication are critical when you think about executive presence. Next slide, please. So why do you think between words, voice, and tone, words, voice, and tone, and body language, why do you think body language is so important? Because body language doesn't lie. 
in my opinion, at least. Yeah, that's right. What else? What don't we communicate a lot with our body language? Have you been in a conversation with, with anybody and what do they do to show you that they're there, that they are listening, that they're attentive and that they're connecting with you? Eye contact. Eye contact. That's correct. Or sometimes What's something else that people do? in agreement, uh -huh. you would see like if they would reciprocate your your actions, like if you nodding or if you saying some suggestive, you would see it. Like the person may not say no with their with their mouth, but if you see them like look away or they shake their head, like you would sub sometimes subconsciously, that's how they show their communication without saying anything. Exactly. Sometimes they lean in, right? When you say, when you're saying things, or when you're communicating, right? They lean in. Um, they lean, lean into you, and to your point, they, 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 with their eyes, they're communicating with you. These, these are body language is such a critical aspect of, and it's all about at the end of the day. Okay, I um, I remember uh, when I was at Wells Fargo Wachovia. And I, uh, I was talking to one of the, the C-suite guys, and this is when I was early in my career. And I, I said to him, I said, with the CEO, yourself, and all of the senior execs on this floor, what is the one thing you have in common? And one of the things he mentioned, he says, Joel, one of the, th one of the things that we have in common is we have the ability to connect with people. You have to be able to connect with people from all walks of life, so from the top of the organization, from the bottom of the organization, all the way to the top. You have to be able to connect. And so body language and is a, is a, a way, and when we, when we communicate, for us to connect with people. And connection is critical in leadership. Would you agree? Very much so. Yeah. So, um, Arch, we could go to the next slide. Please, thank you. So, uh, it's, it's so important to, to look at these lists, this list. And which one of these, you know, res which ones of these resonate with you? So, for example, when you're, commu when you're communicating and, or when you are speaking or interacting with someone and having a conversation, what do you think you know, of someone who in a professional setting rambles or avoids eye contact? And, and, and what, can anybody have any thoughts on, on some of the, the components here for common communication blunders? Um, for Don't me personally, Go ahead. for me personally, it's sounding uneducated, avoiding eye contact, and personally rambling. The reason uh, avoiding eye contact for me, it feels as though you're not being honest with me. If I'm trying to look at you, and you're looking off to the side, you're looking at my forehead, you're looking at my shoulders, but you're not looking at me in my face, I'm going to think that you're personally just lying. And the rambling is mm. kind of connected with the sound and educated. It's kind of like you don't know what you're talking about. You're trying to sell me something or you're trying to communicate something that isn't actually true. And what about, uh, to, your, to the second point, you talk about, uh, you talk about avoiding eye contact and you, and you mentioned it as far as a lack of integrity or someone who's probably lying to you. Does someone who avoids eye contact, do they, do they portray themselves or do they come off as confident? No, they do not. It's kind of like you're scared, and it's, it, it comes off as like you're scared, and you're not sure. Exactly, exactly. Any other thoughts on 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 these these components or common communication blunders?
do you come across leaders who or or uh, business individuals who you know who continue to make off-color jokes or swears in professional settings i mean how does that come across You're undisciplined. What's that? You undisciplined. That yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Swear, okay. swearing in the, yeah, un, undisciplined. When you swear in a professional capacity, you know, obviously there's a time for, for certain things. So you, you're not able to decipher, you know, uh, professional scene from one, from, you know, another more friendly one to accommodate that. Great Joel, point. Great point. Joel, I would like yes. to add, I would like to add that, you know, from my experience working on the trading floor, it becomes because it's, <laughs> the environment is different, where in sense, if you can't raise your voice, you can be run over. So hearing someone using the, the F word is a common place in that setting. In that setting, yeah. So so it all depends on so in that setting, right? So if you work in a construction project, right, or you're your, your construction, um, you, you, you manage a construction, you work in a construction setting or a trading floor, because I know what you mean, Oz. They throw F-bombs and everything on trading floors and screaming. So, so it's, it's, it's quite a different setting than, than your normal corporate um, blue, um, white collar type setting. So I agree with you. Let's let's uh, move on to to the I think it's the uh, last slide. So going back to to and and what does authenticity, right? How how is it that you can you can be all of these things and and be authentic? Is that is 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 that something that's a challenge? You think when you think about well, you have to do all of these things to, to exude or to portray executive presence. What, what are your thoughts on authenticity and, and what does that mean to you? And again, this goes back to, and, and I wanna tie this back to brand, right? I don't know if you talk about it, but, but brand, a lot about brand, the bedrock of brand is your personality, right? That's a, the bedrock and the foundation of, a, of your brand. So let me hear some thoughts on authenticity and, 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 and being, you know, and you, see, you see this thumbprint there is really, you know, how do you balance it? So um, let me give you an example. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I, I know you had spoken earlier about um, your personal experience with working in a very white world. Um, but what are your thoughts on sometimes what are seen as professional standards is really mirroring what are white standards? So, so you know, um, you had a communication blunder as sounding uneducated. Um, and sometimes uh, people say, you know, Bahamian dialect, speaking Bahamian dialect is sounding uneducated or using. Um, AAVE, African American Vernacular English, as sounding edu uneducated, but these are legitimate ways of speaking and communicating, you know, the cultural ways of speaking and communicating. But when you view them from like a certain ethnic perspective, um, they're automatically seen as being less sound or less professional, you know, dressing a certain way, dressing more urban could be seen as less professional compared to wearing a suit and tie. Um, but it kind of prejudices against certain cultures. Um, so how do you balance that being authentic with still honoring your culture and who you are? Even wearing a hair, like having locks, having natural hair, having a uh, kind of shape up and, uh, you know, the wearing your hair long for men, wearing the, the braids or the cornrows. How do you find yeah, out about I, I, it? I, that's a it's, it's, it's challenging at times, but one thing, you know, growing up in the Bahamas and, and being raised that the way I was raised, I was always taught 
to be myself and to feel and to feel confident in who I am as a Bahamian. So so normally, and, and I'm going to contrast that, and, and being Bahamian, and, and we talked about the different ways in which we were raised, right? The deportment, right? The way we speak. My mother was a stickler for ensuring that I spoke a certain way um, and, and that all of my siblings spoke a certain way. So there are certain things that were, were really in, embedded in me. And, and so for me, being in a corporate organ and an environment, it was not as much as a challenge as some of, of my other African American counterparts. Not meaning that I didn't have any challenges, but I, I was I was very self assured and am self assured because of the way I was raised. So when in conversations I talk about my home. I talk about my people. I'm not afraid to talk about and be transparent about where I grew up, you know, and talk about my experience. You know, we talk, so to your point, there's a concept in, in corporate America called covering. And that means to your point is, you know, you, you do want to, you want to hide who you are. And so many of us do that. And I know that a lot of people struggle with that. So, for example, I'm, you know, I have no hair on my head. I don't wear dreads or anything. But I know a lot of uh, my colleagues who want to wear their hair natural and do wear their nat hair natural. It's very challenging. But it's becoming more of a norm as far as the ability to show up and to be yourself, right? To, 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 to bring, we call it bring your whole self to work. It is a challenge. Um, we have instances to your point where um, you have colleagues, they would put, you know, our white co colleagues, they would put their hands on people in people's hair and say, is that natural and, and whatnot. And, and so it's, it's, it's very challenging, but you, you, at, on the other hand, when you talk about being authentic, you know, you have some people who are afraid to say, hey, I'm from the island or I'm from, you know, this is where I'm from and this is who I am. It is a challenge. Um, but I would, I would, and I think that was you, Andrea, I would say that um, for me, one of the things that, you know, that I find more challenging when it comes to authenticity is that oftentimes I don't get the opportunities because I stick to who I am. I don't, I don't play certain games. And there's a certain amount of game playing, right, that, that is a part of the corporate culture. So for me, that is my challenge. But I, do, I, I wouldn't compromise that for anything. Did I, did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Thank you. Yeah. What are some other... Um, May I? May Go ahead. Um, I, I, I got, Felicity has a hand raised. She has a question. Okay, Felicity. Thank you. Uh -huh. I, wanted to, I wanted to just um, speak um, based on what Andre had to say. First of all, I always remember um, the great Bahamian culturalist James, James Catlin putting it so well yeah. when he mentioned that Bahamians, um, we adapt so well to environments. We know when to use Bahamianese, we know when to use the Queen's English, and it always had set us apart amongst Caribbean and African-American people and, you know, other ethnicities. And so that's something that, you know, we, we seem to carry with us everywhere in the world we go. And then when you become an effective communicator, you will find that you can use your English very well, make an impactful speech or presentation, and in the middle of it, you just say, well, you know, as we say in the Bahamas, and then drop in your little, you know what I mean? So it's like you you, you can still be authentically you, you can still remain true to yourself, and you can still abide by world standards. But being authentically you was something that, I, I just wanna share that back in 1995, when I had, I had dreadlocks when it was not common. When I had locks, mm. I was basically persecuted for it. I was one of the trailblazers people in professional settings. There wasn't no, especially with women. So this was like, you know, really out there. But what happened is I knew I was a good reporter. I knew I was a good writer. And so I went where 
I was supposed to, if I, if I wasn't, if I was rejected because of my hair, I wasn't supposed to, to be there. But I continued to push until I ended up on ZNS News with locks. The first, the first person ever as a female, male or female with locks. And because of that, people from around the Bahamas started to come to me and say, hey, I was discriminated on the job because of my locks. And if the locks were on camp, I would tell them. But if they were neat, if they were professional, if they were worthy, I would fight for them. And it made a difference in this country mm. until eventually I seen over the decades, things change until now it's commonplace. And so I find that being authentically me, it was worth the sacrifice at the end of the day. Thank you, Agatha, I appreciate that. Joe, we have another question. I believe that's Prescott Smith. Sure. Prescott, is that you? Okay. Hi. Hey, how are you? Hi, yeah, my, Prescott, my, how are you? Pretty good. You know, it's, it's somewhat of a question, but I wanted to both what Agatha and Andre spoke about, because while we have these, what we call world standards, I, I often remember what Denzel Washington said, you know, if the dictionary does not define us in the right way, then we write our own. And so mm. important for us to remember as well, especially with this foundation and what its goals are, because if we follow what we call world standards, we must recognize that none of those standards lead to our true liberation. And I say, mm. um, so that's very important to take note because there's not one country in the Caribbean that is not controlled by the colonial system. Even though they might have mm. corporations, they have you know the banking industry, you have Deloitte and Touche, you have all of the, and so we must bear that this, the foundation is very unique. And while we have to function on a global stage, we must also be uh, trendsetters like Agatha pointed out, because if we follow the script, the script has not led to our liberation in 500 years. And so mm. every single country in the Caribbean, whether it be Barbados, Trinidad, and if you look at the countries that sat in Germany in 1884, uh, the Caribbean is, an, you know, just an offshoot of it. So the British colonized us here, the Dutch, the French, and you go, but look at all of the systems they have in place. While the light and touche is there, Price Waterhouse, such and such, all of these economies are controlled by very small colonial minorities. And so the foundation is very unique. And so we must collectively, like Denzel Washington pointed out, if the dictionary has black in a negative light, we must write our own version of it. And Agatha pointed that out. So that's mostly what I wanted mm -hmm. because this leadership thing is very important, what is happening. But I, I also want to, I can't stress this enough. As one of the founders of the foundation, mm -hmm. the, the, the goals of this foundation brings a challenge to the status quo. And so I can tell you from my personal life, your integrity, you must, you must be like Agatha's approach and be not afraid to pioneer because that is what is gonna to lead to the success of what the goals of this foundation is about. 
and I we will speak about this at another time because I'm here to, mm -hmm. to learn from uh -huh. learn from you. But you know, Aj can tell you the, the things that I deal with taking on this system brings a lot of challenge. It's just I'm I'm not afraid of them. I caution each and every one of you that they will dig any and everything they can on you for what this foundation represents. And I'm only telling you from what I deal with seven days a week. So mm. that's all I wanted to share with you. And I'm excited about learning from you and uh, learning from you all as we grow together. Thank you. Thank you, Prescott, for, for such a thoughtful, um, su such, such really profound thoughts about um, where we are and what the foundation is. And, and going back to Agatha's point, when I heard Agatha, it, I thought about it. I, what, what came to me is a, a woman who is confident and really self-assured in who she is and comfortable with who she is as a human being, as a Bahamian, as a woman. And, and this goes back to the question that was originally asked of me. And, and I think we all have it as, 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 as Bahamians, but I think it's so important for all of us to stay connected to our roots. So often, because of education, because of financial well wherewithal, all of these things, status, we become disconnected from our root. You know, um, I am a product of, before Hannah's Road was Hannah's Road in Nassau, you know, I grew up on Hannah's Road on a farm and running barefoot on Hannah's Road. And all of these experiences and, and, and um, the individuals, the community that, that were a part of shaping who I am, I am still connected to. And they serve as a pivotal foundation to, um, to who I am today and will continue. And I, will, I am proud of it. I'm, a, I'm proud of my upbringing, my, sim, my simple upbringing, because it's, it, it, it's who I am. And once we, we become disconnected from this, and I think, you know, when you think about some of the challenges you're facing is because we have become disconnected with our, who we are as a people. And, and when Oz introduced me to the, um, the foundation, I really sat down and talked to me there's an overwhelming sense of pride in what you all are doing and the mission that you're undertaking that I think, again, has to do with how rooted you are in being Bahamian, and how rooted you are in the most important things is preserving our culture, preserving our resources. And um, there's no better way, I think, to, to, to show that connection and demonstrate that connection. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that, Joel. It was an enlightening experience. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue our sessions, but we will end our Facebook Live section of, of, our, of our program. For those who are on Facebook, go to our website, www.bahamasnaturalresources.org and go to our membership page and join and become a member of the foundation. Remember, the purpose of the foundation is the protection, the economic viability, and the ecological sustainability of the natural resources of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas for the benefit of Bahamians. Our primary natural resource are you, the Bahamians, the citizens, this is your foundation. This is here for you. We protect our resources and we also empower our people to economic emancipation. That's the journey so that we have a sovereign wealth fund, a ministry of nat natural, natural resources, 
and also that you have sustainable wealth generation for generations unborn. So remember, go to www.bahamasnaturalresources.org, join, become a member, and just make your contribution to this process. Our Emerging Leaders Program is a continued staple. This is our inaugural class. We have some more sessions for over the next four weeks. So please continue to tune in every Thursday at seven o'clock for our next another slew of, of guests who will continue to enlighten us and prepare us for, the, for, for our future. Again, thank you Facebook audience for participating and look forward to hearing from you. Good night. Okay, good evening. So we're finished the Facebook Live. Joel, I would like to thank you very, very much for your contribution. And I think um, if some of your questions were very powerful and significant because if all the emerging leaders, if you guys remember from our earlier sessions, we talked about strategy and business acumen. When we talk about emotional um, EQ versus IQ. So you see where it comes in together in his conversation. We talked about Maslow hierarchy of needs and, and, us, and our, our path to self-actualization. And then we also went into optim improving and identifying your leadership styles. So now in that general leadership style, we see we drill down further with that tonight. And last, last session, we talked about communication styles which, and the presentation style. So that was an important factor. And now, and then lastly, building your personal brand. And tonight, developing and polishing your executive leadership. So I think what's important uh, leaders, if go back to the Google page, review some of those videos, look at those notes and just kind of put all of this together and, 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 and see how, how this is empowering you in the work that you're doing with the foundation and, and, and look forward to our next, our next session will be on overcoming barriers and managing up, managing down, managing across. So next week's gonna be very empowering. Does, do you guys have any questions or comments you want to give to Mr. McPhee tonight? No comments to Mr. McPhee? Uh, just to say thank you for such a great I would just like to say thank you for such a wonderful presentation. <laughs> we actually doubling up. That means it was good. <laughs> thank you. It was it was a it was a pleasure to be here with you and and um, one thing I wanted to say that Oz talked about is you know the, the, I always said and Oz you didn't notice I, I said this in my book the 21st century is all about the development of you know we talk about the, you look at the 20th century and the 19th century the 18th century is about development of natural resources right. But the 21st century is the development of human resources. So Oz, I'm all on a, a board with that. And, and the reason why I think it's so critical is because, and it's so pivotal where we are, is because of technology. Technology enables us to be ubiquitous. We could be anywhere in the world. And, and, and one thing I want to say, as Bahamians, we are unique. And I'm not saying this because I'm just Bahamian. It's the way we are raised and the values that we brought up. There's, there's nothing we can't do. We are exceptional people. And I encourage you, I don't know what your individual projects are, what your indiv individual aspirations are, but I encourage you to dream big, to execute Precisely, and I mean, the world is yours. So, Oz, yes, the development of human, uh, human resources is it. It's, it's where it's at. Wonderful. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much, Joel, for joining us. I see Jafara just joined us. Um, uh, for, fortunately, Jafara, we, we recorded the session so you can catch the rest of it. And as usual, I will upload once we get, get it from Zoom, I will upload it to the Gmail site. Have any of you guys been to the Gmail site, the link I sent you, look at the videos, or am I just wasting my time? <laughs> so, well, I'm gonna put it there anyway for you guys to, to go back and, and research it. I know it's, it's, it's got an hour's time, but I assure you, and again, I just really wanna emphasize again from Joel's presentation, you can see that the questions he's asked 
were based on some of the other sessions that the leaders discussed. And you can see the full picture um, connection of where all of it comes into for you becoming a, um, leaders emerging into the next level of next uh, career and space in your life. One more thing, Oz, if huh? anybody wants to connect with me, just look me up on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. I hope you all have a LinkedIn account. I think that's very critical. Please connect with me on LinkedIn and I will respond. And I, I'm here for you if you have any questions or want to bounce anything off of me. Please do so. But, you know, Joel, thank you for bringing that up because I just want to add that I, there are many Bahamians that do have LinkedIn profiles and those LinkedIn profiles are not connected outside of the Bahamas. So I think we need to get more Bahamians working with their LinkedIn profile because especially with the foundation, as we look at our international exposure and what work that we do, if you limit your vision and your scope of your world just to the Bahamas, you're limiting your growth. So you have to think internationally, expose yourself in the international realm because you never know where someone may be looking for talent in the Bahamas because they're moving a business to the Bahamas. And so there you have it. And they know that they can find persons on that profile, but more so than that, you can expand your, your international network. The, the, the Bahamian diaspora is broad and wide around the globe. And to connect with other Bahamians in an area who may be in Asia or North America, or South America or Europe, it will be an ideal thing. So we are everywhere. So um, that's an excellent idea to create your LinkedIn profile. With that, again, Joel, thank you very much. And Emerging Leaders, thank you. I want to close out to ask um, Mario and Andrea, do you have any parting words, any instructions? Well, just to just to elaborate, um, definitely a, a very excellent presentation. Uh, certainly, um, especially the final piece, uh, which was the reminder to you know to be your own self, and you know that is very important. I remember, of course, what Felicity was saying earlier. You know, our society back in the nineties. I I too remember. You know, everyone's trying to conform. You know, this con conforming. Uh, um, um, presence on the island and you know obviously you know the idea is to break away from that and you know being a part of this foundation and and then participating in these in these um, activities you know helps you to be a leader and to break away from conformity so i would i really appreciate that reminder and i hope everyone has has listened and taken in and again we want to say thank you thank you joel thank you Okay, and then Andrea, anything? Uh, no, just to echo what's being said, um, I thought it was, it was an excellent presentation and very helpful, very useful, um, great insights. And I think are really helpful in terms of uh, assisting us with shaping ourselves as leaders. Uh, so I appreciate your time and thank you. <laughs> Well, wonderful. Well, emerging are. leaders, I will see you guys next week. Uh, you continue with your, pro your projects because I know you're making great strides. Uh, I like what I'm starting to see. So uh, there's growth and development. If you don't see it, we definitely see it. I want to thank you for your work and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.